Boom, and we are live. Feels good to be back. Another week, another episode of the Inner Circle Podcast, the premier podcast for Xbox One. Phil Spencer had a great interview with uh, Ryan McCaffrey, and um, that was pretty impressive. Um, some of the things that he stated answered a lot of questions uh, that was on my mind, and uh, I'm really excited for what they have to show coming up at E3. Um, we're gonna just, we're gonna talk about that um, a ton because it, there's a lot of things that got answered in that interview. We'll also discuss the Xbox One dev kits, um, how that may be controlled because literally anybody can be a dev at this point. If you pick up a second Xbox, you can make games. Um, we'll also reflect on um, you know the idea Xbox program having over a thousand games and a ton of other things that happen to happen this week gaming wise. So let's get the party started. And also we have a guest with us tonight, Mr. Scratch. You guys know who he is. He is the Xbox ambassador. He has his own podcast as well and a very very important person in the Xbox community. So welcome him to the show. Let's get the ball rolling. Let's start. Welcome to the Inner Circle Podcast, the Ramirez. Bo- I always do that. I don't know why I always mess up. I can't. <laughs> I can never get on the, on the, it's the fresh, man. <laughs> it's crazy. All right. <laughs> Welcome to the Inner Circle Podcast, the premier podcast for Xbox One. I'm your host, KOR SKL, and with B Money 101 and Anchorman V. Hey, everybody. How are you doing today? We make up the Inner Circle. Today, we have with us uh, Mr. Scratch, or on Twitter, aka underscore Scratch. What's up? Yeah, man. Feels good. Uh, really glad to have you on. Finally, we've been trying to get you on the show for Appreciate the longest it. time, man. So it's, it's really yeah. good to have you on. Right on. Definitely. So listen, um, Xbox has come out and or shall I say the guys over at Xbox have come out and talked about now anybody can be a developer. You can go out and pick up an Xbox One S console and you can literally turn on the dev portion of it and start making your own games. There's a lot of concerns with fans about whether or not we'll start to get that shovelware that we got from back in the day with the original uh, Xbox 360 program where you had all of the, um, you had the Xbox Live Arcade games and then you actually had the indie section where you could pick up a few exclusives or, or indie titles for like 80 Microsoft points or 50 Microsoft points and things like that. Um, I think it's really, I'm really glad that Microsoft finally has been able to accomplish the goal that they've been trying to accomplish all of this time. Very important that they finally are able to reach some of the goals that they had stated early on when they first introduced Xbox about making every Xbox a dev kit. And now you have people out there who might not have had the money to get an SDK kit from Microsoft. They now have an opportunity to work with the platform and build games. Now, understand a lot of these titles aren't going to be some massively AAA titles, something like that. You will be able to work with it as far as having building your own apps or adding apps to the program, as well as making your own smaller indie title games. What are your guys' thoughts on this? Is this is this a great idea for Microsoft to allow anybody to be a dev? Uh, yeah, go ahead. I think I think it's a great idea. I mean, you allow people. You're basically allowing something your competition doesn't, which is basically allowing anybody to make any kind of game they want. And there's a lot of people who are aspiring artists out there who have really good ideas and really cool stuff they want to make. Love for giving people options. Right. This is one of those things where it, I. I mean, it could backfire. Um, I'm not entirely sure how just yet. Right. It's a possibility when you, when you open yourself up like that for people to abuse it, but I think it's well worth it. Go for it. Yeah, <clears throat> I would agree. I think um, I, Phil Spencer always talks about, you know, it's about giving gamers options, and Microsoft seems to be doing that, and I think in the podcast we're actually going to get into some of those other options as well Right. <clears throat> that were announced this week at GDC, but I think this is actually, I was reading about how it is like with the, it's called the Xbox Live Creators Program. Right. And uh, I know they've been doing, you know, they've been talking about doing this for like, I think you said like since they launched, I I remember thinking like, oh, this will be cool. And then, you know, they come out with some different things like Project Spark and whatever, which didn't really seem to go anywhere. But um, this is actually like allowing you to like use Unity or Monogame or something. And it, it, it looks like they're going to actually uh create a separate creator game section within the store mm. um so it's going to be more like 
you're going to see it. I think you'll see it more like uh, it'll be like the indie games that we used to get for like a dollar or whatever. And there was some good stuff that came out of that. And I think, I think it's good that they're going to um, keep it separate. They actually have a link up in the developer site for um, what you actually have access to in the creators program um, for Xbox live. So like you don't get achievements, but you can use like, um, you know, you, you can do the game hub and the game DVR and the broadcast stuff is pr- supported. Um, so it looks like it's going to be able to integrate like with the social aspect of it, but it's not really gonna, you know, like to your point about like the shovelware, like everybody worries like, Oh, is everybody going to make a dollar game that gives thousands of gamer score or whatever? So like that ecosystem will stay intact. And I think it's cool that Microsoft thinks about stuff like that. Cause that was my first question uh, right. when I heard about it. It's funny that you say that because um, I remember Chris Charla coming out recently and he said something similar, like they're not just going to let anybody put anything on the program. Obviously, it has to go through some sort of filtering process. You don't want any type of, you know, perverted uh, games or anything like that to hit or anything that's inappropriate that should not be on the Xbox. I think a lot of people think that this is just some type of now loose uh, um, um, Ubuntu <laughs> platform <laughs> that you could right. just throw anything on. It's not that, but it just gives people the opportunity to maybe if you wanted to be someone that you you understand code, you understand how to develop games somewhat, it allows you to finally achieve some of the things that you wanted to, maybe as someone who's starting to become a developer a teenager, somebody in their young 20s, somebody just getting into school, getting into that. I think that's uh, it's really important that they do that. But for me, the biggest point is they're, they're hitting this goal, this goal that um, they have now been able to put out a title that, uh, not a title, excuse me, they've been able to put out this console that allows people to put out games or apps across the platform. And that is something that we've heard for three years and finally seeing that come to fruition to me was very important and a big step in stone for Microsoft overall. Mm-hmm. I mean, also keep in mind, you got like a lot of indie developers, like uh, the guy who made Stardew Valley. I mean, now you're, like, it's one guy who made an entire game, mm-hmm. which is now like really popular. And now you're basically opening up the opportunity for, you know, everyone else to do this just on Xbox. I and mean, he did it on PC, but I mean, you, you open up the opportunity yeah. here. Right, right, absolutely. Yeah. And I think you saw that with with XNA <clears throat> on the Xbox 360. Is there was actually a couple of games uh, through there that you know originally came through like we're going to be on the XNA or whatever, and then they ended up being you know ID at Xbox, obviously, well XBLA back then, I guess. But um, you know they see them and they pick them up and they're like you know they can they can give them support or they can like you know if somebody has a really good idea and like really good talent this is an option to almost sort of like pitch your game a little bit and then if it doesn't get picked up you can still release it um but it gives a little bit of you know it shines a little bit of a light on on some people who you know who otherwise might not have the opportunity exactly and i think that's really important being able to give people an opportunity to uh live out their dream just of listen if i could be a game developer right now i would I, I truly and utterly would. I've always dreamed about making games. It's clearly not as glorious as uh, you know I think it is, or, or not as glorious as I want it to be. Clearly, um, but it definitely is. In my mind to want to be in the industry and want to be able to actually uh, either write or create amazing stories and i think people have opportunity to do that now um how in depth that will go i don't know but the fact that microsoft is giving people the opportunity to do it and really no other platform is out there doing it i think that's that's a plus in their book and kudos to them and things like that so that's that's really big moving on so program has uh you know has been a very very big part of what Microsoft has been doing the last couple of years. Um, we all remember the 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 arcade that Xbox 360 had. Some of us still uh, yearn for that environment of the uh, you know some of arcade and <laughs> all the cool indie yeah. games you would get right on the screen and a completely separate section from the actual AAA titles. Because and I, and I said this before, I know. Greenberg, I spoke with Aaron Greenberg about this on the show at one time, and I spoke with Chris Charlo on the show about it at one time. And and both of them stated something that I thought was very important. However, I also feel like it kind of, regardless of what they want it to be, the reality of it is not, and I don't think people see it as that. And that is that 
for them, it was really important to let people know that it doesn't matter that it's an indie game. A game is a game, whether it's a AAA title or an indie title. And I think that's absolutely correct. I think that is um, the smart way to do it. However, at the same time, your biggest problem becomes now your indie games get, I guess you could say, swallowed up by the AAA titles as everybody bas- bypasses some of the imagery that may not look as fantastic as a AAA box. You know, it's one thing to look at a game from someone who has this, you know, cute little puzzler with amounts, and right next to it is For Honor when you got a Viking on the cover with a battle axe. You know, it's 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 definitely not the same case. So I get where they're coming from, but I also I uh, also think that it was really great that the indie section had their own section because it really emphasized some of the really cool titles that was out there that you could really look at and kind of you know sift through and things like that. The whole point of this topic, obviously, is that recently Chris Charlotte came out and spoke about how um, the idea Xbox program has over a thousand, a thousand indie games in development for the Xbox One platform. Now, obviously, some of those are multi-platform. All of those aren't exclusive. However, a thousand titles is a, is a very amazing accomplishment. Just a few years ago, I remember when they talked about they had a few hundred. Then they had over 500. Now we're talking about over a thousand and we're hitting the thousands. And that's great. That's that's great. Um, and, and the biggest thing to come out of the IDX program has been the preview program, the games that come in early, that early access mm-hmm. stuff. And I think that's just very, very special. So many gems have hit that. And I've discovered a lot of titles. And to this day, I'm still playing Ark. I don't know why. I'm so addicted to this game. This game has done me dirty so many times. I've lost so many dinosaurs and so much equipment is so glitchy and buggy. This game, literally, <laughs> if it launched, if it launched as a retail title, would score a four out of ten from anybody. But in my book, it's almost game of the year because it's so addictive and I just love playing the title. So it's just funny. But over a thousand games is a big deal, guys. I mean, uh, is this a big accomplishment for for Microsoft? I was just going to say people love ARK. I mean, it's just, (laughs) yeah. before we get far off that, I just wanted to say that because like you could, if you're a YouTuber, like make a crappy ARK video and it'll probably be your best performing video. Like everybody loves that. It's funny. I don't know Mm -hmm. why, but. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That's the appeal, man. I mean, the preview program has been by far the most interesting thing to come out of Xbox. It was the one thing nobody else was doing. Right. They were like, oh, the console right. was here. Try that out. Right. And it's interesting, too, like how your perception of the game is different. Like, I think, like Kyle was saying, like, you're, it'd be like a four out of a 10. But because it's in preview <laughs> and it's okay, like, it's 10 out of 10 now. Because of the preview. Right. You know, now, I, know, I, say I, I have my own thing. I wish the, the program would do a little bit better, which I do think they need some sort of timetable on a lot of these games. Like, okay, you can't just be having the game out forever in preview. Right. right. That, that's like, my when one thing really about the game. Like, or just right. the games that go into that program. Like, they need something like, okay, you're playing to release within the year. Like, if it gets delayed, okay, that's fine. But there is a bit of a requirement here. Like, you need to be on some sort of timetable. And I think, see. and I think you run into that too. Like going back on topic before I derailed, but <clears throat> basically, like when you have like over a thousand games in development, like it, it's it's going to be like it start to be like pretty crowded release schedules. We had what like eleven games last week or week before. Yeah, yeah. it was. I mean, it was we're hitting double digits in in a single week for the amount of games that are that are coming out. Um, right. You know, re- releasing alongside. You know, like you said, like AAA titles, like like For Honor, for example. I think there was mm-hmm. at least six that week, actually. Yeah, something like that. I, I think I think that's one of the reasons why I feel like the indie section ha- should have its own section, because like you just said, you had how many, like eleven, almost six indie titles released last week. And be honest with you, that that didn't make a blip to a lot of people. It, it really didn't, because the the advertisement for these games isn't hitting the way it did on 360. You know what I'm saying? Right. I just remember seeing so much advertisement for you know the next set of indie games to hit. It wasn't even some of arcade, just 
you know, a few indie games hitting or play this now and it's just released and you would hit the indie section and you would see the newest releases or you would see the highest rated and you would go through those indie titles. You know, if you just wanted to pick up something, you had a few dollars, you had 10 bucks, you had 15 bucks. You just want to pick yeah. something up and you find a gem out of that arcade. You know, that was really special. Nowadays, it's harder, in my opinion, because they have the mix up. It's like For Honor came out. That's all people thinking about, <laughs> you know, Halo oh, yeah. Wars 2 came out. That's all people thinking about. Like people aren't really grasping at the great job that the ID at, at Xbox program is doing. And, you know, us at Tick, we're big advocates for indie developers and the indie scene. Um, we, we have a ton of indie developers on um, our show. We mm -hmm. have a, a completely dedicated section to all the indie developers that we had on um, our show called On the Red Carpet. And some of the best ones that's coming out, like Ashen, which uh, I can't wait to see. Hopefully, we get more information on that soon. And the Lost Pisces. As a matter of fact, Lost Pisces, I was able to help get that game on Xbox. And that's something I'm very proud of, getting those guys in contact with Chris Charla and, and getting them linked up to communicate with the idea Xbox program and have that game be worked on for the Xbox One. And I haven't heard anything from them. In a while, and I'm wondering if they're making this game from Scorpio because it already looked fantastic when we first saw it. If you haven't seen this right. game, definitely check it out. Um, hit our uh, playlist section and check out the Lost Pisces um, on the red carpet in the Tick Podcast section. Amazing looking indie title. It's 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 a combination of of Tower Defense and um, Shadow of the Colossus. That okay. sounds crazy. It sounds crazy, but you have to check it out. And you battle, you do battle with other um, constellation signs, Cancer, Taurus, um, Scorpio. Listen, you got to check it out. It looks dope. <laughs> this is Scorpio DLC. <laughs> I will check yeah, it out. Yeah, right, Scorpio DLC. Right? Yeah, definitely check it out. But listen, man, um, Idea Xbox program is very successful. I have to get Chris Charla back on the show. We haven't had him on in about a year and, a, and some change now. Um, but I've, I've spoken to him often. One of the things that concerns me about the Idea Xbox program is that there are titles on the program that are actually on the PlayStation. And as the newly owned PS4 owner, I, I happen to see that. One of the things was like a drift. I know they went the VR route, but... You know, I was I remember this game at E3 2015 and saying here saying to myself, I oh, was it 16, I don't remember which one, but one of those E3 presentations at the Microsoft conference, and sitting there saying to myself, Man, this game looks amazing. You know, you're just trying to survive, you're floating out of space, your sh your ship is wrecked, and I can't wait for it to come, and it never ever shows up. I get PS4 and it's right there in the store. And I'm like, what is this doing here? Why what happened to the ID Xbox program? And um I know that's coming that initially was a part of the program i just recently spoke to these guys is um deliver us the moon from ko ko ken interactive but the thing with them is they've gone multi-plat because they actually got picked up by star breeze studios so you know that's a big congratulations to them I, absolutely they're no longer completely independent they have a publisher and that game will be going multi-platform and that's going to be a big title as well if you haven't seen that check that out in the playlist section that was our last recent interview but uh a thousand games is a big deal and i really hope that uh you know microsoft's first party studios also follow suit the way the IDX Xbox program is going. They only need a thousand games, but you know, if they could pick up the slack with some really good, awesome new first party studios or first party titles that we'll get talking to next, um, I would be ecstatic and happy to see what they start to pump out. Yeah, <clears throat> I think there's a lot of cool games in the GDC <clears throat> uh, that they've showcased this week. I don't know. Have you guys okay. checked any of those out or? I have not, not yet. I was supposed to have a correspondent hit GDC. Unfortunately, something came up. We weren't able oh, to get okay. them out there. Um, yeah, they have some. They have some pretty. They have some pretty cool ones. Like there was one. Like it's called. Uh, I'm trying to find it here. It's called. It's like graveyard something. I don't know if you've heard about it, but like it's. It's just. It's like a. It's like Stardew Valley, but you're a graveyard instead of a farm. <laughs> <laughs> so like, it's kind of interesting. Like you have to do whatever it takes to build a thriving business so like i'm assuming like you maybe become a murderer or something 
What? Um, it's pretty That's weird. Crazy. Yeah, there's there's wow. there's so many games like that. <clears throat> there was a there's a Fable Fortune game. Um, that's set in the world right. of Albion, but it's but it's more of a of a CCG, a collectible card game. Right, I remember that. Yeah. So I'm curious to see like how some that. of those will do, but like they they have some really good stuff uh, that they're showing at GDC this week. That is, you know, like I said, like you're saying with a thousand games, like how do you? I don't know how you manage that. Like I don't know how Chris does that. Like to determine like who gets most of their energy because they can only help like so many people before they start running out of resources to people of you know and having so many people at different stages of development and that sort of thing so right it's going to be right. interesting but some of these look pretty good right um before we start the next topic give me one second let me run because my son is driving me crazy he's calling me and i will return shortly all right was, in, the me, uh, in the meantime to kind of fill the space scratch what are you playing lately so I've been playing. I heard you said earlier before we started. You said that you finished For Honor. I'm about halfway through it. Um, I've been kind of really stuck in the single player because the, the multiplayer we had uh, so so much exposure to that. Um, I actually flew out to uh, San Francisco to Ubisoft. Flew me out to play that, <clears throat> and so I was hoping that we would see um, some of the single player stuff there, and we did. And I was hooked on it, and so I was super happy to finally get to. Um, play through those it's actually a, a pretty good storyline i mean i think i i think the sticking part for me is going to be you know the multiplayer but i i did like the story mm -hmm. see I, I started i actually i finished the story and i'm like how, i have how, how, how many chapters have you completed you've gone through the, the way the game's set up you have three different chapters you start off with the knights and then you do the sam uh, not the samurai you do the vikings and then you do the samurai it all just kind of comes back together again yeah i'm about halfway through the vikings right now you sure you're literally at the halfway point <laughs> yeah yeah right exactly I have, I have a lot left to do i played that and then i had trulon which released i think it was last friday mm -hmm. um but uh i haven't had a chance to play all of that too much uh played a little bit of halo wars 2 um the last week was xbox mvp summit in seattle so i flew out to that and i was there for a week and i did play some games but not not anything, you know, we just played like multiplayer games and with each other and stuff. So I didn't get a chance to really dive into Halo Wars 2 yet, but I was, I liked what I played so far. Cool. Sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Back. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Son is uh, <laughs> losing his mind. His tablet's not charging. So he's extremely bored. All right. So <laughs> listen. <laughs> That's so important. <laughs> Yeah, it really is for him. Yeah, uh, no, Phil okay. Spencer had an amazing, I won't say amazing, he had a great interview with uh, Ryan McCaffrey over at um, Podcast Unlock, the quote-unquote number one Xbox podcast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, number one Xbox podcast, according to Mr. Ryan McCaffrey. He, uh, he talked a lot about some of the things that I – was ranting about recently as far as what Microsoft is doing. I, I'm still big on fan service. I'm still big on bringing back some classics and rebooting those franchises just for the st nostalgia factor. Um, we didn't really get a focus on that. But the great thing about that is he addressed a lot of things that I think uh, flew over a lot of people's heads. And I want to talk about those things. Um, to begin, I want to talk about some of the things he stated. And before I jump into the Scorpio thing, I want to talk about something that was really that really caught my attention. He talked about how when Microsoft wound up canceling Lionhead Studios, Let's Play, they canceled Fable Legends, um, they they uh, canceled Scalebound, and that he had to make way. And this is exactly what he, I won't say exactly what he said, but pretty much what he was saying was that he had to make way. Um, and move some things out the way that just honestly wasn't panning out. They, those games weren't panning out. Working with those studios, it wasn't panning out. Understand that, uh, again, the Fable Legends things wasn't something that the Lionhead team wanted to do. Unfortunately, for whatever reason, the game didn't pan out the way Microsoft wanted it to pan out, and a lot of people lost their jobs, and the studio got shut down. And on that regard, yes, I, I really put the blame on Microsoft for even attempting to go that route in the first place. On the other hand, with Scalebound, Scalebound was just supposedly a mutual thing. Um, 
I've heard otherwise. But at the end of the day, Scalebound didn't get done. The, the 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 studios had to separate, and it seemed to be a a mutual breakup on good terms. And according to Phil Spencer, what that allowed them to do is actually focus on some of the new studios that they actually have and some of the new games that they're working on. And he said some of the times you have to get those things out of the way to bring in the new stuff. And I'm sitting here saying to myself, wow, I wonder if that was more of a, less of a, I need to get this stuff out of the way <laughs> and more of a, let's clean up what Don Matrick did this is the Phil Spencer era. I'm bringing my stuff in because that's exactly how I felt when he said that, you know, mm -hmm. that scale bound game. No, seriously, like that scale bound game in Fable Legends was a dime metric ever signing. Don't get me wrong. Phil Spencer's in charge of he was in charge of Microsoft Studio. So clearly he had a part in it. However, uh, at the end of the day, that is a dime metric sign off. And moving those projects out of the way to bring in the projects that Phil wants to do bringing the new studios that he feels is going to put Microsoft on the map because the one thing he constantly talks about is following in the steps of Nintendo and how strong that first party is and how important first party is and stuff like that. And that's something that a lot of us haven't seen for a while because you, we have this, this oversaturation of Halo and then the, the biannual uh, release of uh, Forza and Forza Horizon. Now we have Gears and we didn't get the the game that they initially were working on, even if that project was just a demo of sorts of what they possibly could do. It was a project that they were playing with and could possibly have developed into something else that got shelled for gears. And a lot of people were frustrated with that. Scalebound yeah, was this. Yeah. yeah Scalebound was his new IP. You said, what'd you say? I was one of those people who was really pissed about losing on Shanghai. Right. Exactly. Um, and then you have, you have, um, you know, you have Gears of War, and then you have Scalebound being canceled, which a lot of people felt it was the game that really separated itself from the pack. It was different. It was just completely different from anything they had had, and it really gave it a, a, a huge, diverse, um, I guess you could say it really brought the diversity that Microsoft needed. And with that being canceled, it turned a lot of people off. Um, but it seems Phil, he has something up his sleeve now. He said that it may not be a major big AAA bomb title. We don't know. It may not be. It may be. Um, but the one thing I took from that was that they have new games and that they're working on and they have new studios that we don't know about. Did you guys listen to that? Yeah, I did I, not listen to it. Um, but they're two of my favorite people. <laughs> so I'm interested <laughs> in hearing what, hearing what they say. Because like Phil's always really candid about stuff like that. And right. um, it's interesting to, to kind of get a peek into... Um, <clears throat> just, you know, just how things go. Like you said, like with scale bound, like, you know, things like just, it didn't work out or, um, or whatever, kind of going back to what we were talking about of the, the, the dark underbelly of game development. Uh, there's, you know, we, we really only see like as consumers, a lot of us only really see, you know, the celebration part of it or the launch parties or, um, you know, the stuff like that. But if, you know, if Microsoft has these, um, you know, new IPs or, you know, unannounced games or, or directions that they're taking to, you know, fill in these places. Those, right now, those people are probably still working. Their wives are mad. They haven't seen their kids. Right. Um, you know what I mean? So, like, there's there's a difference. So, it's interesting when things like this happen because it seems like you look at Scalebound and you would think to yourself, like, why would they ever cancel that? Like, what, right. what happened there? You know, right. but there's a lot of things that we don't see or don't know about that you know, that kind of take place between, um, you know, what they have to do. But I'm sure I know, I know Phil and that was probably, you know, obviously not an easy decision because like he, he gets it. Like he get he's a huge gamer, you know him too, but I mean, it's a, he's a huge gamer, big into games, big into the industry. Like he knows when he makes those decisions that, you know, mm -hmm. that those people are going to lose their jobs. Um, Right. On you know, on on the same note though, I mean that talent doesn't leave because they start up, you know, these other smaller studios. Um right. <clears throat> you know, I was thinking about this, um, and not to put words in anybody's mouth or whatever, but when you were saying about uh moving things out of the way, sometimes you know, I'm thinking to myself, I wonder how many of these studios um are closed down or broken up 
because of these, you know, different happenings. And then the people who were like the gold on the on the project end up, you know, going to work, you know, on other. It's like the the people who were the brains or behind Scalebound, like they might not work, you know, on that game anymore, but they still are good people and they still have ability to create awesome content. So we could still see some stuff come from the talent at least. Yep. I agree. So it makes me wonder, like when you say like, I wonder what they have or, you know, cause, cause there's still a lot of people out there that, um, you know, can, can create the stuff at least. And maybe right. the other people are like out of the way now, if that was, you know, in a way, Right. To see what to see what comes from it. it's going to be really interesting e3 i think but go ahead with i'm curious to know what what else was on there because i like i said i didn't listen to it yeah i mean they they had a focus on and that in that particular segment that 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 key word about moving sometimes you have to move things out the way to bring in new stuff it was it it kind of shocked me it kind of wowed me because i wasn't expecting him to say that um now that's not exactly what he said Right, but clearly you can interpret what he's saying in that regard. That yes, they're not going to just go to E3 and show you the same few games that they had. Um, what he's what he did state was that if you think I have some type of megaton bomb up the sleeve, I I might not have that. And again, it's a might not. Why would you announce that you have a megaton bomb at E3? Like no, you <laughs> right. hold it. You don't announce it on the show. So everybody's like, no, they don't have anything. Like come on, let's be real for a second. If you mm. have some type of surprise, you're not going to announce it on the unlocked especially when E3 is X amount of months away. Um, and also the thing but, about that too is just that Phil, Phil as a general person is, I would call him a pessimist or maybe even a realist when it comes to the approach. He's not very, he's not about, I'm going to, he, he always says he's going to over under promise and over deliver. Right. right. He always says that right. terminology when it, when it comes down to stuff. I think he even said it on the podcast. And this is the same situation. I mean, he's not going to come out here and say, I'm gonna give you the the E3 of dreams. I'm not gonna like hype you up beyond all, <laughs> all recognition, right? And then right. find out. Oh wait, never mind. But like when he speaks right. to E3, think... there's like mics all over the floor. Like he's just dropping them every every other word. Like last year was amazing, you know. And but he talks like that. Like you say, like he's just like, oh, you know what? Well, we'll do what we can. And I think he's more of like a driven and focused. Um, you know, like he says, this is what we're doing. We're gonna do it heads down like no sugary you know talk and he's really real about it so i'm getting like really kind of excited just kind of talking about <laughs> you know what i mean but like it'll it'll be interesting i was upset i was upset recently not because of what microsoft had done in the past i i thought that they produced some really good titles i was upset because i didn't like what they had happening in 2017. The loss of scale bound to me was big because that was a title that was supposed to release in spring, according to what they had talked about last year. And getting to OG Xbox games was not, not something I'm fond of. Even if you love Voodoo events and even if you love Phantom Dust, for me personally, it wasn't something that I found to be oh amazing to hold me down. So I was disappointing in what Microsoft presented. And that's not to say that at the end of the year, scale, you know, uh, not scale bound, excuse me, crackdown, um, Sea of Thieves. Um, State of Decay 2 won't be amazing titles. We won't know until they release. I, I see a lot of people downplaying the, the lineup already before this stuff has even released. And that's just disappointing because you just don't know what to expect with these games until they come out. And, I, and obviously that's just the fanboy thing. You have fanboys. Everybody's always trying to downplay something. I right. see people downplaying Horizon Zero Dawn left and <laughs> left and right when it comes to the xbox side and then you have guys on the other side just downplaying the entire xbox lineup so i mean it, it goes both ways right so um it's just funny but i just found it very interesting that he said that and i thought that was an important topic to bring up if no one noticed that he said that and i think people should be excited i'm excited it really rejuvenated me and, and really you know really revved up my confidence in what microsoft is going to show at e3 because for a while i was really genuinely concerned about what they may present at e3 um so we'll see what happens man i'm excited again i like like scratch says there's a possibility some of the people that maybe got released from Lionhead are actually still at microsoft in a new studio capacity you know people who may have left 
uh, people who may have been released when they released Let's Play, those that studio actually broke up into two different companies, you know, working on two different games. And that's not to say that some people may not have stayed at Xbox and, and working with a, a different studio altogether. So we'll see what happens if they if they announce Fable four in some capacity from a new studio, not lying ahead, but something similar or something close to it. That would be great. I think a lot of people would be excited about that. That game was so close to being done that you probably could really just flip that whole game very quickly and in a you know two year span and really just make it into a Fable Four title if you wanted to do that. In my opinion, I think they should just reboot the whole franchise. That's just how I feel. Some people don't agree with me, but I think they should really just change the whole art style you know, make it more mature, drop the fart jokes and the kicking of the chickens. <laughs> I just think they should really make it a serious Western RPG. Just something, it's just something that they're missing from the, the Xbox uh, side of things. So moving on. So Phil came out and um, he talked about how, because having the conversation with Ryan, one of the things that a lot of us fans talked about was, Get Scorpio out of the way. Release it early. We want to know about this console now so that when you get the E3, we can learn about all the games you have. One of the things he said was the reason why he couldn't do it early is because he felt that it wasn't ready. It's not ready, clearly. However, the the key thing in that in that discussion was that even if the console wasn't ready at this particular time, he didn't want to spend an entire show or an entire hour of the show on Scorpio, just talking about it. And that really opened up a gateway to maybe having an earlier reveal than actually note it and really just focusing on games at E3. This is a big deal. This is really a big deal. If you interpreted what he's saying correctly by stating that he doesn't want to just have Scorpio at the show and just focus on that and really take up a good majority of time or a half hour of the show when he has all this content to present and he wants to present it at this show all at one time. So there's a strong, very, very strong possibility we may get to see Scorpio earlier than expected. I have a couple of thoughts about that, actually. Um, Traditionally, for what I've seen, especially over the last three years, the general mantra has been Fe January and February suck <laughs> for Xbox guys. They don't really release anything. It's real quiet. There's not a lot of news going on, and you keep hearing about what the competition's got all the time. Now, March, though, is when they start turning it around. It's like they start doing the wake-up call. So now let's have a little roll call. Who's Who's still awake? And right. March, they try to they try to throw stuff around. They try to throw, bring people back, whether it's with games or announcements or however. Now, I got this feeling that he kind of like planted that seed of Scorpio because we're gonna get something early. But I don't think it's gonna be like a full fledged like, hey, here it is. I think it's gonna be more like, here's what the console looks like. Yeah. That's it. And to your point, <clears throat> to your to your point, we're seeing that now uh, at GDC because you know they've just announced like the the Xbox Game Pass, the you know the everybody's a developer now. If you want to be um, all these you know all these new games, the uh, <clears throat> they had like the Women in Gaming event and sponsored all that stuff, and so and it's March, you know, like mm -hmm. it's, it's March, and so like that's starting to kick back up. I I do agree with you. It's it, January, February seemed to be a lull. Just in general, and it's funny how <clears throat> I think it was uh, Jez I was talking to on Twitter with Windows Central, and uh, you know he was bringing that up that you know like it, we have like you know we're in a two month lull uh, between where right. things you know start to come off. I think it starts slowly between GDC and then with PAX, you know things start to pick up, and then after that we're into the we're heavy into the E3 season and they've got the planning done and stuff. And it seems like Microsoft just takes January and February to like come back from the holidays and then just sit down and plan out, um, you know, where they're headed. If you look at the Xbox one release, if we all remember how that went, um, right. they actually revealed the, <clears throat> they revealed the, um, or did they, let me look at that. Yeah. They, they, they revealed that. I'm not sure. I think they yeah, revealed they that, did it before that E3. Really. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was about, it was about like a month or so before E3 because I remember I had a yeah, it was like a month. Yeah, it was it was pretty, it was a couple of weeks before they they showed E3. I remember um, 
because they they had a heavy focus on a lot of the features. Literally, they really didn't show any games until the end where they oh, showed yeah. Rise. Right. <clears throat> and so Rise. and you know, and so they they have to like they probably think about that stuff. I I'm, I'm assuming. I don't, you know, I don't know, but I know that that, that seems to be a time <clears throat> and it's just it's just funny that you Anchorman that you brought that up that you know that that does seem to be the case like this month just starting with GDC typically seems to be where um they'll start to like just like you know kick off the edge of the pool and start swimming out to see where they get to right mm-hmm. right well you know I I do hope that they take the initiative to show the console at least a week or two before it um one of the key factors that Phil talked about in in moving the show to Sunday which I thought was very 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 smart was that they talked about how every time they release a you know they release their show or they start their show one of the things he liked was he loved to kick off E3 with the Microsoft event and they no longer do that because they have Bethesda do it early last year. You had EA's uh, thing last year. You had Ubisoft last year, all on Sunday, I think it was, or, or something like that. I think Ubisoft might have been Monday. Um, but at the end of the day, they weren't the ones to kick it off. And then at the same time, following them, you had Ubisoft, you had Sony, um, you had all these other conferences where really a lot of their content um, that they released early in the day obviously gets swamped with other content and you kind of forget about what they may have presented and you kind of question who really won E3 when people start doing the comparisons of who was better, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So having a show on Sunday and also the time slot. Yeah. The time slot was key. Yeah. The time slot. Um, Yeah, because I've seen, I've seen the PS4. I've seen the PS4 or the P the PlayStation event almost every year live and I always have to watch a recorded version of the Xbox one because PlayStation goes later in the day right. um, after work. And I saw all the coverage last year that was on Sunday. Um, right. With Bethesda, it makes a big difference. It's a big difference. I think another thing he said was that he didn't like that they had to rush their show. Because the next show came on literally right after they ended theirs. Right. It was that time slot. It really was a time slot thing. And having a show on Sunday where their show starts at 2, I think that Bethesda show didn't start to like 5 o'clock or something when we went there last year. Maybe mm-hmm. maybe later uh, than that. Something like 4.30, 5 o'clock. But that, that was over right. on Pacific time. Yeah. yeah, that was on Pacific time. So that show was about 4.30, 5 o'clock. And then right after that show ended, we had the after party, which... I don't know. We was there for hours, like two or three hours after that, <laughs> which was amazing. <clears throat> but Microsoft having um, this event on Sunday allows them to have a two-hour show, something that we constantly beg Microsoft for. We want them to extend their show. We want to see everything. You know, we don't want it. We want to get. We want you to present your best forward. And and I really hope that they do that this year. They really need this opportunity to gain momentum. Uh, going into the holiday season and really show up the future uh, at least 2018. Um, And that brings me back to some of the things that he said he learned from the scale bound decision was that never to really announce anything early, even though he's been in the game for a long time, announcing scale bound so early is one of the reasons why people were so disappointed because if had no one known about the game, if they didn't announce it so early, then like some other games that get canceled, you wouldn't have really had so many passionate people lose their minds over it because right. we don't know nothing about the game. <laughs> you, right. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I, I think him going forward is even if he may not, and I want I want people to understand this. <clears throat> if you're listening to the show, and first and foremost, I want to thank everybody who stopped out tonight. We have 42 people watching right now. Please give us a thumbs up. Uh, I don't even care if you give us a thumbs down. At least give us something. It's greatly appreciated because we know you're listening. Um, it's it's important that people understand that if he doesn't announce anything going into 2019 or late 2018 or something like that, that's because he doesn't want to overhype or have high expectations for something that may not pan out. And to me, that's a smart thing to do. They really should focus on something like what Bethesda does, where it's like, we have this game coming out this year. We never talked about it. This is what you're getting in six months. And that's what they should do from now on. 
You know, it's always good to have one game, maybe two games that you can say, you know, spring 2018 or something like that. But for the most part, anything you got coming out of, you know, winter 2018, summer 2018, don't talk about it. Just hold it from now on. I think that will be a a a strength for them later on because it, it gives you the element of surprise and you're not seeing the same games over and over at E3. And at the same time, um, it keeps people in the dark about what you have. And those who don't right. expect you to have anything will be shocked when you do present it. So I think that was really important. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, I, I kind of agree with that, but at the same time, I think there should be some titles where people can anticipate it and be happy for it. Like, say, okay, you got like one or two games where I'm just waiting for this game. And like, just have that. But then, like, I, I still agree in having surprises, but at the same time, you want so you can look mm-hmm. forward to it at the same time. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> it's definitely, right. it's like a double edged sword, you know, like, a, like, you know, you don't announce something because you know you you don't want to like set like a false es- a false ex- expectation or or fall short of of people's expectations because you have no idea when you announce something how it's going to be. I mean, I guess you have part of an idea, of, but like how it's going to be received, right? Like, so you could you might announce like the uh, something that you that they've been planning for. Oh, we'll announce this because it's going to be just kind of a you know. Uh, back burner game that some people will care about and then for whatever reason it goes viral and takes off um, or <clears throat> you know or you decide to you know not announce something and then everybody's like well you don't have any games what do you have coming you haven't announced any games so it's like okay well let's announce games and then it's like where is this where I thought this was coming y- you know what I mean so like it's, <laughs> right. it's like what do you do you know it's it's y- you you can't you can't always win. I, I I can't imagine like what goes on like in the meetings of like to determine, um, because it's so it's so dynamic. Like to determine like where exactly to take it, uh, because you're going to be looking at, you know, all of these things, things you don't anticipate. Like oh, we thought people would like that more, or I can't believe look how look at how this is being, um, you know how how this is being taken off. We don't have nearly the marketing budget set up for this that we should because this is blowing up all over YouTube or something. Um, right. You know what I mean? So it's 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 a constantly evolving, constantly changing um, situation there. And quite frankly, I'm glad I don't have to completely think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, you just have to pick up the games. All right, so we're moving on to uh, close to pretty much our last couple topics. The greatest thing out of all of this, out of this whole event, was when Ryan brought up and how Phil talked about it as a premium console. But the one sentence, the one sentence that caught me off guard, I was not expecting Phil to say this, was the way he described the console and confidently expressed it. He states that Scorpio will be demonstratively uh, I guess you could say, uh, how can I say this? Um, Scorpio will be dis- d- demonstratively, I guess you could say, different or more powerful So, on the market right now. And to use such a word and to use those words in that way just shows how much confidence this man has in this product. And he pretty much said exactly what we at Take Podcast have been saying for the longest time. Everybody's always stressing about how, you know, Microsoft wants Scorpio to sell. If it doesn't sell, they're out of the business. They need this console to sell. And I keep telling people, this is not that type of console. It's a premium device. The same way people looked at picking up the Xbox One Elite controllers is the same way Microsoft is presenting this console. It's a premium device. It's for the hardcore guys out there that spend X amount, amounts of money on all of these games and every exclusive that comes out. And the guys that go out and buy these Elite controllers and have these amazing TVs, these guys that have these amazing premium sound systems, the people out there who want to get this console. And for everybody who thought this thing was going to be $400, I kept stressing. 500 was the mark. 500 was the mark. And I wouldn't be surprised if it hit six. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm going to reiterate I, it. Just I from this one show. I agree with you about that. <laughs> already came out and stated as much. Listen, the, the, the one thing that he states in that is that 
is that the Xbox One S is the console that they know is going to sell more. They already know this. He came out and said this. He already knows Xbox One else, the Xbox One S is going to sell way more than Scorpio because it's a cheaper device. People are not going to go in to the store. And like he said, mom and pops are not going to go into the store and be like, give me this hardware because it's this amazing. It's this crazy premium product and it costs X amount of money. They're not going to do that. They're going to find what they can get to play the games that their kids want at the cheapest value. And the Xbox One S is what gives you that at the cheapest value. Scorpio is for the hardcore gamer. It's for it's a premium device for the hardcore gamer. And I'm telling you, this console is going to start at $500. That's going to be the max. But it's going to have the power behind it to make the money worth it. It's going to, I'm, I'm telling you. Dude, we, we know it's going to be a tiered console. They've already stated this. But it's going to it's gonna start at $400. Like here's, here's start the thing. at $400, bro. In that they're asking you to spend $400 every three years. I've said this Let's before and I'll say this again. Microsoft strategy, from what I see, is going to be more like a mobile market, just not every year. Just like half Let's make cycle. a bet. I bet you, you can't play any new Bethesda game for the next two years. That, that's way too If much. this comes out. <laughs> that's, that is what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's way too no, big of a no bet, especially because Bethesda is being the best publisher no right Bethesda now. Game for, the new, for the next two years. I bet you this console comes out at four ninety nine. Wait, this console comes out at four hundred after everything he stated today. I, this, I'm you, still you, go, you, you go that, listen that to Unlock. Way too big of a bet. <laughs> go listen to Unlock right now. I already did. I listened to it, and what he's saying, it, it's a premium console. But what you got to understand about that is, it's not. You have to look at it long term. You're looking at they don't care about face. the long term with Scorpio. This is what I'm trying to explain just, to you. This is why you're not listening to me. You're not comprehending what I'm saying. <laughs> they, that's not what this product is. You're looking at it from the perspective of they have to sell this product right now. I'm not saying that. I, all they, I'm saying is they're, they're looking at I'm it in listening. terms of when you have the console cycle, which is about five or six years, they're expecting, okay, at the very beginning, you spend $400 and you max out that money all the way through. If you want to jump on later, you're spending 250 Maybe two hundred dollars no. to get this console. Listen, what they're saying is premium experience. You're spending eight hundred dollars total over the course of one generation. No, edge. No, what are you talking about? What are you talking so, about? Think about. Okay, that's not what they're saying Look, at you all. You bought your Xbox One three years ago, well, four years ago, ten. What are you? You bought. How much did you pay for it? Four ninety nine. You paid four ninety nine. Now when Scorpio, I mean, uh, three ninety nine. Uh, yeah. No, four ninety nine, right? Yeah, five hundred. Yeah, four ninety nine. Five hundred. You spend five hundred dollars, and so what right. they're looking at is under a traditional console cycle, they got about five six years of ma you can max out that hardware. And so you spread out that five hundred dollar cost over between the between the length of about five six years. You're spending only about a hundred dollars a year if we're being uh, if we're only doing or being a little pessimistic here. So what I'm saying <sighs> is, when you say you're cutting that in half. You're spending over a longer period of time twice as much money. And so basically, Anchor, I don't even know what you you're are about. spending a premium price to stay on the cutting edge. Anchor. I don't, I don't, I don't understand. Listen, I don't know how I could shove this into your skull. I don't know how to get you to comprehend what is happening here. If you truly think Scorpio is going to come out at $399. You are sadly mistaken. I think the console would not be four hundred dollars. The, the bottom base tier Scorpio will be three ninety nine. I think there will be a five hundred dollar option. This console is going to come out at five hundred dollars. It's going to be it's going to be four ninety nine. That will be the base model with one terabyte of power. That will be the premium device. It will. It won't go above six. I can say that right now because the key word. I definitely uh, some won't of the go above said, six. Right, it won't go above six. That's not going to happen. The key word in that is that you will never, you won't see everything that they put out will be priced as what they as consoles that we have today. That was the key word he said a, a while ago. At the same time, people, and it is the same thing with, with, with Ryan McCaffrey. People are trying to find out is this going to be a four hundred dollar console? And the fact that he brought up it's a premium device right after he said that tells me it is not going to be a four hundred dollar console. 
it's 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 so evident this this console is not gonna be four hundred dollars. It's not. Scorpio is what you get for that four hundred, three hundred. 250 range. They're going to wind up moving out the original Xbox One's Scorpio. Will re- I'm not Scorpio. Xbox One S will replace it. You got a 4K Blu-ray player, 4K upscaling. It's what Xbox One should have been. And you have those consoles in tiers. But if you want the baddest of the bad, the baddest console on the market that's knocking everything out the way demonstratively, according to Phil Spencer, that's probably going to hold everything down for a good two or three years before PS5 or the next console from Xbox comes out. Scorpio, and that's going to start at five hundred dollars. Now, over time, as you get to those three, four, five years, and you start working on your next set of things, yeah, the price of Scorpio drops three hundred, four hundred, because now you're moving into where uh, uh, the value of the console starts to deteriorate over time. Things get smaller. You start making a smaller console you come out with a scorpio slim and then you move on to your next iteration of power to compete with ps5 if you think this console is coming out at 400 to start dude it's not you it's not you better start saving now you better start saving now if you don't have 500 do it now i'm telling you <clears throat> it's an inter- <laughs> it's interesting to think about it like well i mean if you look at if you look at the price of like xbox one when it released and it released with connect and and we don't have connect now, and so that's hardware that, um, you know that 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 they're not going to have. I mean, at least I don't think so. Uh, you know, on this one. And then if you look at like, I mean, look at look at how bad Microsoft got beat up over that price tag versus what the PS4 released at at the same time, and the PS4 was was more powerful in certain respects, depending right. on on which thing you argue over, and. I, I mean, I almost wonder about if, if like Sony wasn't taking a loss at that just to undercut the price to just just to sell more because you can see it at selling a console at a cheaper price obviously um, worked out. Um, you, there's no denying what the last two years have been like completely, and so I'm I'm in the middle. I I I can't I can see them like fighting to to keep that price down and. Um, you know, I, I mean, I do get what he's saying, like, and I didn't listen to it, so to be fair, uh, but I can see what he's saying about, like, you know, it is a premier, you know, uh, price point and all that sort of stuff, but you could also be talking it up like that, and then you release it at a cheaper price, and, like, people jump all over it, because, like, they he- listen to the whole time about, like, how yeah. premier it is and how expensive it is, and they expect, like, people right now are like, oh, this is going to be... 600 bucks you know 550 or whatever and then when it drops at like say 450 or something like that it suddenly looks like a good deal um not that it won't be i I think it'll be a good deal anyway uh, you're bringing up a good point i would agree it's about under promising over delivering if you tell people a premium console also think about what the deal was when the xbox one launched they got panned for 500 dollars and you want to say this is that's a premium because console, the console you drive a five hundred dollars. You're saying, oh, the Xbox, the original Xbox One bundle with Connect was a premium console. I can see the fanboy arguments now. Yeah. <laughs> it was just really not popular at four ninety nine. But like, so that's why I'm that's why I'm stuck in the middle with this because, like, they right. probably almost have to release at four ninety nine. Like, you know, to to Cal's point about. Um, you know the, the 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 what they're building. You know, I mean, it's going to be at least worth that, anyways. Um, but then on the other hand, I mean, they they got punched in the face over the four ninety nine price tag. Um, it really wasn't the price why they got punched in the face. It, it's the value of the console wasn't worth the price. First of all, we really got any connect games for it. Well. So you shove the connect in there. You're talking about before the console even launched. We have Battlefield One at seven twenty p. People already lost their minds. If the console comes out and everything is 1080, 60 frames per second, no one complains. Everybody buys the console at 500. And eventually they wait or they pick up the console. No one complains about the price. It's the fact that it was underpowered. Now you're giving something that's overpowered for this generation. Not the next one, but this generation in particular. And the key word in that statement, and and I know Scratch, you didn't hear it, but he said they're going to price the console at what they think is worth. Right. It's worth 
Not what the fans think is worth. Not what Anchor thinks is worth. What they think is what worth. Think that is. console is going to be five hundred dollars. <laughs> like, I'm telling you right now. This, I hope to God it releases at three ninety nine, just because. <laughs> 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 that would be so. I'll tell you what, though, if that thing launches at three ninety nine, you can no longer be the last son to play at Xbox. <laughs> That's uh, why I'll change my name. I have no problem with that. I'll change something last son, uh last son. You can't play no you can't if, if it that, hits that is way it hits that is so unfair. No. <laughs> First of all, years. you're making me change. If I have to change my whole if I have to change my whole uh personality logo type thing, you I'm have to you can't have to, play no but that's the game for two years. <laughs> two years. I don't have to change my logo, but you're making me change my slogan. If I gotta change my slogan, you can't play no but that's the games for two years, bro. Two years is way too long. <laughs> That's not even equivalent. How about, nah, right. <laughs> How about this? He nah, can't. Play, I gotta can't play Bethesda game like on release day or release month, and then you have to change the slogan for like I don't know, like a month. That that will work. Let's do that. Let's do that. Game. What, what, what's <laughs> the new? What's the newest? The the next the next major yeah, Bethesda release until after May, which would be Prey. Listen, listen. No, I don't. I don't want to use prey. You picking up prey? Yeah, you a fanboy for prey, aren't you? Hell yeah! You can't play prey <laughs> for one month. But we won't know. It, well, no, prey's gonna come out before. That's we won't thing. know. We don't know. Okay, so listen. The next release, the next Bethesda title that releases after Scorpio drops, after Scorpio drops at the end of the year, the next Bethesda title releases. You can't buy that game or play it for one month if that console comes out at four ninety nine. And I will give. A, I will call myself the last son of PlayStation for an entire month if it comes out at three ninety nine. Now nah, it's got to be a year because you're all you're, you're doing. Old is Dan. You old Dan. A year? <laughs> Me? Come on, son. The last son of PlayStation. Do you know how disrespectful that is to myself? Let alone Superman. Come on, bro. The last son of PlayStation. I can't do that for a year. That's too much. I don't know. That's you're already the last son of playing PlayStation as it is. That's not really no, that not. insult. <laughs> Don't hate on me. Not, you're a hater. It's because I got a PS4 Pro. You know what I'm saying? At the end of the day, though, that console is going to be $499. That's, that's what I believe it is. A premium console, premium device, based on Phil Spencer's words. And uh, I can't wait to get the E3 to see what these guys present. I'm super excited. Uh, very, very reinvigorating for the Xbox fan base and stuff like that. Uh, before we head out of here, man, I just want to touch on two things. One, Zelda, okay, is just astounding and crushing Metacritic with its scores left and right. It makes me want to go out and buy a Nintendo Switch right now. I, I have to do it. If I would have, I, 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 have I would to, have, I have had, had one for eight minutes, and I'm kind. Of <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. Switch looks very interesting to me. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I want to pick it up right now. I got two consoles. I, I just bought an SUV. Like literally less than three days ago, I just bought a new SUV for my family because my car is just getting too small for uh, a four-year-old and, and a five-month-old. So I had to upgrade more size, more trunk space, all that stuff like that. So I'm not getting a Switch anytime soon. But I definitely want to ask. I, I literally felt like asking my parents to borrow $300 just to pick up a Switch because I want to play Zelda that bad. It looks so good. It really does look that good. Oh, it's funny. Um, and of course, Xbox Game Pass. Is this a big deal or what? Um, a lot of people, a lot of people don't realize how big this is for Microsoft. Um, I, I think it is a very smart. They said they've been working on this for three years. Phil Switch just said they've been working on this since as soon as he got in, they was working on this for three. This is not something that they just happened to do. This is what I'm talking about. This type of thing is something you keep under wraps. No one knows about. And honestly, this was actually like E3S. This is something you announced at E3 and really blow the doors off stuff. Um, if you're able to get like big titles in, like you know, a month or two after they release, you are gold. You are gold with this program at $10 a month. Right now, it's only a $10 a month subscription. Um, they and, and he talked about this on Ryan's show as well. What he said was, was that they will rotate some games, not the whole library, but some titles out 
It won't be a lot. It'll be a, uh, just a handful of titles, maybe five to ten out of the hundred, because what they don't want to do is have it be like a glorified trial where people play the games and then all of a sudden you can't play them no more because it got rotated rotated out. So I think what they'll probably do is take the games that people aren't playing the most, rotate those out, and rotate in a new set. Um, Actually, what he Bill told about, about that too. He was saying the reason why they said things can go out of rotation is simply because they can't promise it'll stay there forever because publishers will have some control over it. it. Yeah, that, that's, that's the big why. issue. The publishers will have to have a little bit of control over it, and so it's got to be like, well, we can't promise they're going to be here forever. So it's like right. Netflix. Because like, every every publisher will be <clears throat> will be different. What was that? Right. Every publisher will be different in terms of like what they agree you can do with their game. Mm-hmm. I don't think and, it'll be uh, like within the first three to six months or something like that. No, I think maybe after six months. Sure. But yeah. Right. And um, just to finish up his point, um, one of the cool things he brought up was that he said it would be really awesome. And one of the things he would love to do is get some of the episodic games to release in it the day they come out. So right. that way, when you put out an episodic title, you know, being able to work with people like uh, the guys who make King's Quest or the Telltale series and things like that, um, or even Borderlands, um, you bring those guys in and, you know, you have them release a title the day it launches within that program because you're already paying 10 bucks for the subscription monthly. Um, and then as the month rotates out, you rotate into the next episode, which I think is very, very smart. Imagine a game like Hitman that's episodic coming in day one. Mm -hmm. on gay pass and you play the first episode and then you get the next episode within five months you've completed the whole entire game um you know and and, and that's almost like a full price title because it's, it's right. fifty dollars you spent but you're not thinking about all the other titles you got with it the other 99 titles you got with those titles so i think it's really smart really impressive i'm really impressed with what they've done with game pass mm -hmm. yeah i think i actually did a <clears throat> shameless plug but i actually did a video um, about this and then I had people um, answer in the comments and then I actually have another video where um, I just sort of spoke about it in like a asynchronous podcast sort of thing about just about this topic is all and uh, answered some of that stuff and there were some really interesting things that came up in that so I'll just um, bring one up is that you know if there's so many people are like <clears throat> I think the common theme that was that was there was that it was going to be for it's not for me because I'm a hardcore gamer and all these games are old and I haven't and I've already played them. And right, so right. I, I mean, I think I mean, they haven't even announced what the 100 games or over 100 games are going to be uh, for right. starters. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, one of the things that I, that I thought about is, is like, look at the idea at Xbox program. And if you if you look at what Microsoft does with things like they have a way to be able to get you to spend that money. And here's here's the, <laughs> here's my point in that. So if you look at the games with gold, games with gold isn't all a bunch of old games. It's mostly old games, but occasionally there is you know games that release, um, like <clears throat> like Volgar and um, uh, I. Yeah, a lot of new one. indie titles. Uh, right. So yeah. many me was one. Uh, you know th these are all games that had never released before, and they released free if you have that. So it becomes a little right. bit worth it in that sense because if you do that in a <clears throat> if you do that in a format like this, it's basically like buying that game and getting you know ninety nine of them free, and it's worth it because they could potentially be a bunch of games that literally no one has ever played. Um, right. I, I, <clears throat> and that has to do with you know that's all has to do with licensing as well. Like if you if you look at like things like Volgar and whatever, I think he had it on his blog or, or you know where he spoke about it. And basically, Microsoft buys the game and then distributes it. Like they're like, look, your game might sell this month much based on our research, or we'll give you this much guaranteed to let us release your game, you know, on the ID or on the you know right. as games with gold or whatever. You'll get a lot right. more exposure. You'll get a lot. Everybody will see it. We promote it. Um, you know, all that sort of stuff. And to a developer, that's like, well, that's maybe a good deal. Like, I take a little bit less money, but I get a guaranteed check and a whole bunch of exposure. And then as a gamer, you know, we get a cool game <clears throat> that we've never played for our money, uh, which adds, you know, so much more value to it. And, um, you know, everybody wins that way, I think. 
And uh, I, I feel like this program could could do that. Um, Absolutely. So, I mean, I, I, th I, I think that's definitely a, a route that we could see happen. And interesting that you mentioned that he's mentioned that already because I hadn't heard that, but that's what I was thinking. Yeah, no, I, I, you know, having this idea in place for three years and working on it for three years is uh, very astonishing because I definitely didn't think they were. I mean, the announcement of backwards compatibility at, at E3 2015 was a big deal. It yeah. really was a big deal. A lot of people were ecstatic about it. It increased my library tenfold just because of so many of the 360 games that I purchased um, from over the 10 years that I had in Xbox 360. Now you're telling me that you you give access to people with Game Pass. Now, the thing about it, though, people have to understand that, yes, it's a mixture of Xbox One games, 360 games, uh, possibly some indie titles. There will not be a component where you have EA games because EA has EA access. It's not to say that they may not work out something in the future. He brought that up as well. Um, but currently right now, no EA games will be hitting the Game Pass. But what's, what's really interesting is that... Um, him trying to get the episodic content on there, uh, being able to figure out a way to get new new games on there. And really, this is really a focus at the person who isn't a heavy gamer or guys that are willing to shell at $60 every game, you know, per game every month, $120, you know, right. $180 on three titles in a month. Um, I think that if you're a mom or dad, and you go to the store, and someone says you can pick up the Xbox Game Pass, which gives you over a hundred dollars for ten dollars. That's an instant selling point to any parent, right? To any parent. any parent, sure, yeah, any parent. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, you you tell a parent you get a hundred games for ten dollars, they are sold. So that is it's it's a great selling point for Microsoft. This is this is huge for them. You get this coming over to Scorpio. It reduces in price over the next two or three years to about four hundred bucks because it will be four ninety nine, regardless of what Anchor says. And, <laughs> and I, I will refine that bet. <laughs> I, I will, the only other game this isn't over. I, I, will make deal. I will not play right. a the only other twenty seventeen announced game within the launch month for Bethesda. I will not play Quake. Man, nobody cares about Quake. I want something <laughs> real, like. There's no other Fallout Five, I can't, bro. I can't no guarantee that. Now you said yeah, launch you. month, so like if it releases on like the 27th, like you I don't just, know when it's coming out for so. three days, or <laughs> it's got it's got to be after the launch of Bethesda Scorpio. has done a lot of stuff in the very early parts of the month. All right, like May, don't weasel your way out of this. Out May 5th, uh, Dishonor right came on. out like on like it was December. <laughs> He's nervous. Like <laughs> they come out early. <clears throat> Yeah, okay. So about anyway, the Game Pass, one thing yeah. I just wanted to say is a, there is a general consensus of like it's only going to be targeting the new gamers and that sort of stuff. But if you think about it, <clears throat> I think it's something that everybody is going to get at least a month because there's like nothing that says that you have to subscribe to it and then stay subscribed forever. But think about like if you just like got $20 for your birthday or something and you just subscribe for like just a couple months and then just like achievement hunters or hardcore gamers that want to, you know, rack up a bunch of gamer score on some of the games that are in there. Like you, you don't want to keep the game. You, you just want to get, you want to finish it. You yeah. You can just drop 20 bucks, fill out as many as you can, and then just unsubscribe to it and then be done with it. You know, like I think, I think the, uh, the new people, they're the ones that are going to stay you know, stay subscribed, but there's, there's going to be so many things. I think it's going to be for more than just the new people. I think as, as I read through like my comments and stuff like that, I just noticed that, you know, like people were bringing up those points about like, you know, like the release of, of new games, you know, into it, like indie games or whatever, but also for achievement hunters, like just to, you know, they won't keep it for a year probably, but I bet they get two months out of it. Or a month or, or two, just you know, who's not going to drop the ten bucks to just yeah. grab a few of them and you know and and catch right. up on it? That's what I'm saying. It's really cool because it's not something you have to be locked into, and I think that's really smart. Um, you know, there might be something you want to play out of those hundred games you never played that normally might be thirty dollars on the store right now. And what's cool about that, by the way, I, it, I just reminded myself of it. If you have Game Pass and it's a game you want, you get a 20% discount on the title when you buy it. Right. From the store. 
That's just insane. That's that's crazy value. You get 20% off if you want to own the game and don't want to lose it if it rotates out. And then you get, I think, 10% off the DLC. What? Incredible value. That's incredible value for something that's 10 bucks a month. There are games that you probably may get if, if the new ones hit. You could buy a game and pick it up right. for 20, you know, get 20% off. That's it's a great deal, man. I, I can't knock Microsoft on this at all. I'm impressed with this Game Pass situation. It may not appeal to the hardcore gamers that want to buy all the digital titles and game share, and you got a buddy and you're both picking up great games and it's hitting. It may not appeal to those guys, but it's definitely going to appeal to new Xbox gamers. Halo 5 is going to be on there, so it's going to appeal to those guys. It's going to appeal to parents. This holiday season, Microsoft may kill. <laughs> they they really may kill. A lot of people talk about exclusive lineups, but Shadow of Mordor is what like one of the first titles announced um, for Scorpio that's going to really take advantage of the hardware. And if that pans out, it looks as incredible. Um, and and because we all know the gameplay was amazing, I love Shadow of Mordor. Um, and if that that it. pans out, and the, yeah, if the graphics look as incredible as Phil says they should look, and this Game Pass thing really takes off. You got EA access with that. There's just so much value with Xbox at this point. 4K Blu-ray player. It's harder than I not to pick one up. Right now, you can argue it. This season, it's going to be a pretty hard argument not to pick up an Xbox, whether for Scorpio or One S. And that's just God honest to truth. It really is. Well, guys, listen. I want to thank everybody for stopping in um, on this Friday morning. <laughs> really love doing this, this show really, really late because we get um, the West Coast on the evening, which is great. We get the Midwest, the Midwest and we get the, the, the East Coast a little bit late. Um, but the great thing about it is that we, we get a lot of people in to join the conversation and uh, talk with us and stuff like that. So listen, very grateful for everybody stopping out tonight. Please make sure you give us a thumbs up um, and a like is what I mean. Not an actual thumbs up in the chat. <laughs> a like and go ahead and retweet that out to your friends. We are very grateful for the support as always. Um, again, Tick Podcast. We have Multiverse Podcast every Monday at 8 p.m. with Anchorman and crew. On Tuesdays, we have our new PlayStation podcast, Trophy Life. Go ahead and tune, that, tune, tune into that with Chris, Nick, and Kev, um, of course, Super Pod Shots uh, will be returning eventually. I'm going to try to get one out next week and take podcasts on Thursdays. And don't forget Double XP on Fame Entertainment's channel. Scratch, tell us what you right. got coming up, man, and where guys can find you. Um, you probably the best place to find me is um, about.me forward slash scratch. That's where everything is listed. Um, okay. I've got some videos coming up on my YouTube channel. Um, I stream every Tuesday and every Tuesday night <clears throat> and every Friday night on the Xbox Ambassadors Beam channel, which is beam.pro forward slash Xbox Ambassadors. Mm. Um, I'm just just a about dot me. It, 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 I'm everywhere, all over the place. So um, yeah, definitely. just check that out and pick your poison, whatever works for you. Hey, if you have the Xbox calendar, man, just pop on the calendar. Scratch is on there. You can <laughs> you can find them on that calendar, man. I'll be there. You mentioned you, on you mentioned you saw me there. Yeah, or yeah, I, I saw you up there. Uh, you know, like meeting new Xbox guys. I think that's really awesome, man. I would love to get on the Xbox um, as an ambassador and then hop on the ambassador channel, play a few games here and there. So I'll, I'll definitely sure. look into that and invest in my time more to the ambassador program. Right um, again. So listen, guys, I want to thank everybody for stopping out. We will be back next week, Thursday at 11 p.m. I want to thank Scratch for coming on the show. Thanks and for having me. You guys. Oh, absolutely. It was, it's was. it been a pleasure, man. Great insight, great information, very knowledgeable about Xbox, and that's what we love here at Tick Podcast. We talk sure. about Xbox positivity, and that's what it's all about. So we'd love to have you on again in the future. Sure. Um, so I'm your host. KOR XKLL, the last on the planet Xbox with Anchorman um, B Money. Unfortunately, was not able to make it, but we will get him on next week's episode. And we are off this planet. You guys have a great night.